Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Roger Dargaville. I'm an honorary fellow here at the University of Melbourne. I'm also a lecturer in renewable energy at Monash University, but I used to work here at, at Melbourne. And I had the great pleasure of being the supervisor, or one of four supervisors I think we had, for, for Martin Weinstein, who's going to give a, a talk. Martin did his PhD here at the University of Melbourne. He's actually officially graduating tomorrow, so we can't officially call him Dr. Weinstein until after that ceremony, but he, he has completed his PhD. Uh, he did here um, uh, in the Climate and Energy College. And his area of research was looking at innovative business models and challenging the concept that we should be running our corporations for profit and looking at what the barriers are and what would, what would be involved in shifting to a for benefit world where companies are run to optimize uh, the uh, benefit for the planet rather than just making money for shareholders and all the legal implications and comparing that to ecological systems and how ecological systems regulate themselves. But uh, Martin's uh, moved away from that a bit and he's more in much more the entrepreneurial space now. Uh, he's working at Yale University um, in a, a group called City, the Center for Innovative Thinking. Um, and he's gonna give a bit of an introduction about that. Uh, and he's gonna talk about three different uh, incubator projects that he's working on there in, in the program that he started up. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to Martin. Uh, please make him very welcome, thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, and it's almost like surreal being back here after almost a year. I was, I was so excited to, to stop by Melbourne. Um, I arrived on the weekend and um, I'm, I'm here until next week. But I thought it was, I was like, why, why am I so happy to, to be here back? And obviously, it's been 14 months and I, that I stood right here to give my completion seminar. So this is a, such an intimate environment. My desk used to be right behind this. Um, and so many things have happened in 14 years, in 14 months. Uh, Melbourne uh, had half the high skyscrapers that it has now. It's crazy how things are changing. Um, the also fun thing is my, my dad is here in the back and my, my, my father's here visiting for, for my graduation. He's been asking for the last, uh, I'd say 15 years, what I do for work. And uh, I always fail miserably. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'll try and, and fail again. Um, and I think the last thing is that Every talk I've given here at the at Melbourne Uni, I was as part of my PhD, kind of uh, showing my supervisors and, and our, our college what I was working on. Whereas today, the idea was just to share a bit of what I've been doing for the last uh, 12 months. And that kind of segues into uh, a talk that is less like a lecture, more of me sharing a bit of what we, what we do um, in the US, uh, what I've set up. And so if at any point in time you have a question, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, normally, I, I uh, that's a bit disturbing, but I don't think it will it will be the case for this one. So, as Roger mentioned, um, after I finished my PhD, I, I moved to Yale University um, in a newly developed center called the Science Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale. And at the same time, MIT wanted me to run a project on uh, the use of blockchain that I'll, and, and solar energy that I I'm going to talk a bit about. Uh, but for uh, migratory purposes, I, I stayed at Yale and, and have an active collaborator at MIT. So I, I jumped between New Haven and, uh, and Boston constantly. Um, I'll talk a little bit uh, about the, the Sci Center. This is a, a very boring uh, table of content that normally it's not my style, but it just makes it very simple. just want to share a bit about what's the overall umbrella that holds me in, in the university. Then um, the, the logic of the Open Innovation Lab, which is what I, what I started um, at the center and at Yale and with, um, and to some extent, borrowing a lot from the thesis for my PhD, but turn it into an entrepreneurial uh, uh, organization within a university. And the type of projects you've been incubating. And incubation is the right word, but at the same time, it's more just better described by origination because we don't bring a project from outside and incubate them. We just uh, come up with ideas and start developing them. So that'll be the logic for today. Um, the Sci Center it has a year and a half now. Um, it's uh, it was set up through a large uh, donation from uh, Joseph Sai, who's one of the founders of uh, the Alibaba Group in China, and. Uh, I think you know, U.S. Uh, universities have uh, 
have been quite disruptive in the fusion between entrepreneurship and academia. Uh, one thinks about Stanford, uh, MIT, uh, Harvard has a lot of history of that too. And Yale's been lagging a bit behind. So this was a big, big, big bet around, um, around bringing this university-wide innovation entrepreneurship um, hub uh, similar to some of the things that uh, I've seen developed here at uh, Melbourne Uni as well. Um, but with a difference, it's very student facing. So as part of the center, they, they invited me as, as an innovator in residence, which was kind of like a total wild card. And the executive director just said, like, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to explore more of the fusion between uh, academia and entrepreneurship. Uh, and, it, and a lot of my research has led to the importance of open innovation, open source, and, and collaboration for large global challenges. And so that led me to propose the lab. Um, our role really is to inspire and support students from every background. We have a huge focus on diversity um, and uh, no disciplinary uh, barriers, in fact, probably anti-disciplinary center. Um, and uh, it's very much focused on real world problems, which is quite a kind of a broad term, but it allows students to think about practical things, which is quite important because Yale is historically a very uh, theoretical university. Um, and we, I'd say, in the arch, overarching part of our work is uh, in the center is to do a lot of programs with students, for students, workshops, hackathons, uh, boot camps. Uh, we structure them around uh, different different groups. Um, there's a lot of learning about new new technologies or new practices that we do, and everything we do is actually extracurricular. So um, students become a member of the center join are part of a project or part of a program um, and it's really out of their uh, spare time and it i said it's it's university wide so we have undergraduates and obviously the uh, yale college is a, is a big uh, uh, undergraduate body probably a principal part of the university but also master students phd students and we also uh, every now and then involve uh, staff and, and faculty as well um, but one of the key parts that we structured uh, as part of the project is most of our uh, programs are six months um, four to six months long, right? So they run by, by a semester. Uh, but we wanted projects that could run for a year or two years. And so this is where the space for labs and initiative came in. And we have three. Um, one is around knowledge equity. So, so knowledge and information uh, coming out of lived experience, not necessarily uh, books and titles. Uh, we thought this was an important part to focus on as, as, as we see more bottom-up uh, approaches to solutions. The other one is a series called We at Yale, which is women entrepreneurship. And so we, uh, we showcase a lot of uh, women entrepreneurs across the United States or internationally if they stop by visit. Um, and then so lastly, this was um, where the Open Innovation Lab sits. Um, I think the first semester when I, I moved into uh, uh, Yale around February last year, uh, literally Melbourne to New Haven, um, but we launched it around August last year. And I'll, um, you can go openlab.yale.edu and see a bit more and the team I normally source, um, uh, students that are interested through the programs that we do, I can spot some of the uh, brilliant undergrads or masters or PhD students that. Um, are excited in some of the projects we do, and then uh, most of the time I either hire them as a part-time uh, job within the lab, um, or they're just part of it as, as volunteers. Um, the, the logic that, that uh, made me kind of frame a thesis around the lab is uh, we have uh, Earth system challenges that, uh, to me, makes everyone a stakeholder. Uh, and and we, a lot of the global solutions require multi-stakeholder collaborations in, 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 in how we've developed them, but also a big part around open source, uh, around not segmenting solutions to specific, uh, let's say, intellectual property uh, bubbles, but rather more of an open in innovation approach. And um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring in is the role how emerging technologies can help um, uh, can help as tools to drive open innovation. Uh, and I'll, I'll just briefly say that in terms of our system, we, we've mostly focused on climate and energy transition. So to some extent, a lot of the things that I've learned from Malte and the college here have been great seeds for me to think about how to structure uh, innovation hubs to seed off uh, projects. Um, 
And within the emerging technology field, in the latter part of my thesis uh, here uh, as a student, I was picking up a lot of interest around decentralized uh, distributed ledger technologies. Um, part of my thesis was around peer-to-peer -peer technologies. And so blockchain as, um, and as the distributed ledger allowed a lot of disintermediation for peer-to-peer -to, -peer to be more real, as opposed to, for example, Airbnb that, that still has an intermediary in the process. Um, so I thought that this was a, a good broth that necessarily probably didn't have a, a specific structure, but out of that could produce uh, an intersection for innovative ideas to, to flourish. Um, and I'd, I'd like to say that it, to some extent it, it borrows a bit from, from my thesis in that there is some systems thinking approach. This is like global problems, where are key leverage points, and then design thinking, which is also the way I structured my thesis here. Um, what are ideas that we can uh, develop that can have an entrepreneurial track? Um, so it's, it's, it's a bit unstructured in that sense and allows a lot of like, ab abductive thinking in the process of, of doing that design thinking. Um, so in the last, let's say, 12 months, um, I, while, while setting up the, the logic of, of this hub, um, I needed to come up with some projects to start kickstarting and bootstrapping um, the lab. And so um, we now have three incubated projects um, that I'll talk about today. Uh, one's Energy Academy, which is a, a virtual reality um, immersive um, a platform for immersive experiences around how do we uh, reteach um, the role that energy has on the planet. And I'll talk about it relatively briefly. Um, um, I want to focus a bit more on Open Solar, which is um, a project that we do in collaboration with, with MIT and is around the role that blockchains and smart contracts can have in, in automating contracts for project finance. And then finally, uh, uh, something we were just we had doesn't really have a name. It's more like an open earth challenge, but it's around the the role that distributed ledger technologies, IoT, and a lot of emerging digital technologies as a whole family can have in global carbon and climate accounting. I thought this was very interesting to talk about today because um, while I was doing my PhD, I was very much focused on energy, not so much climate. And so so that project does involve a bit more of a, a climate. Um, science or climate knowledge that um, this is why it's a this is kind of also a great pitch for me to to share a bit of about what we're thinking around there and how we can spot uh, collaborations between the, the college the hub and and, and Yale. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk very briefly about the Energy Academy. It's uh, actually the project that I've been wanting to do for quite some time um, and it's it spins off uh, and again it has a website that you can you can visit uh, talks a bit about the logic of the project so sometimes projects um, get to a sp certain stage and they have their own website their own team um, uh, it doesn't have um, obviously the thing that takes projects to the next level is funding to some extent and, and, uh, and real-world pilots uh, this one's been more mostly a, a test um, to look at the intersection of, of VR um, and it, this was one of the things that uh, I probably say four or five years ago, um, I was, uh, visiting Stanford and I saw this large, um, Santi diagram of the, the flow of, uh, solar energy through the entire planet. And I saw them as journeys. And so I said, well, wh what if we could teach, uh, how energy connects, uh, us all, uh, literally in this global ecosystem, through the journeys that um, that solar energy has in the path through planet Earth, and so first I thought about zooming user interfaces and the cross scale navigation that that might have, um, and then the project you know can be quite broad, and so well you know there's five key journeys that solar energy has as soon as it hits the planet. You think about a um, a whole book but we said well why don't we turn a book into a campus and so we designed uh, a, a virtual campus a virtual energy campus that the user goes in and each geodesic dome has a specific experience that's tied to the 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 flow of, of photons and and, and uh, solar energy as it journeys through planet earth and I'll, I'll give you a very brief uh, view of what that is so this is experienced through uh, an HTC Vive, a fully immersive uh, VR headset. Um, this first dome is called the Earth uh, Campus Headquarters. You move around, um, and uh, this one doesn't have a lot of, of interactions. It just more is about thinking about key concepts that we normally 
used to teach uh, large uh, planetary issues. Uh, the user leaves the uh, the dome and it goes into the. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a bit skippy. It really like as, when you look at it, it's kind of like. It's fine if you get a bit dizzy. Uh, <laughs> uh, normally, my presentations produce that. <laughs> um, uh, so th this goes into one dome. It's called an energy observatory. And so we have a full scale of, of the solar system, not in distance, yes, in terms of relative size. And it's a portal for the user to say, okay, well, let's start, let's start with uh, the, really the start of the show when we think about energy. Uh, so the dome fades out, and uh, the user is teleported into uh, the sun. And so this is almost like the beginning of, of, of the story um, that, that then uh, we, we had some key functionalities like being able to load a, the photon beam that goes from the sun to, to planet Earth. This is to scale in, in, the, in the sense that, and so pick up a magnifying glass and see the photons at, at trying to look at uh, the, a different scale and see how they've committed their path towards planet Earth. Um, being able to load information, physics and, and, and chemical information about the sun. So these are just uh, some key prototypes. I, I guess most of what, what we do is, is it starts at proof of concepts phase. Uh, this is a, a, a middle point between sun and planet Earth and those 162,000 terawatts of energy constantly in flux in the planet. Um, going towards uh, planet Earth, and then seeing those ski journeys, most of that gets reflected uh, since our atmosphere works like a giant mirror. Um, and most people you know, just enjoy being, uh, feeling that they're in space, uh, part of air absorption uh, producing uh, wind and, and photosynthesis and evaporation. Photosynthesis was also uh, a key part for me to be able to showcase how this journey would, would work. Um, so in this case, by choosing the photosynthetic pathway, it takes the user to another dome that is around photosynthesis. So it's mostly trees. And what we, we did to try to think about how to follow that photon beam into the, the photosynthetic metabolism across scales, spatial scales, is to put a leaf in like a microscope and take the user inside the leaf. And then uh, uh, also being able to load a, a magnifying glass. So uh, we, we imagine, test, we've been testing this with different uh, uh, college, uh, but also uh, high school students, uh, teaching uh, the photosynthetic equation in, in, a, in an immersive way. I, I would like to say that we have a very clear understanding of how VR can Bill, uh, uh, take a role in the future of educational technology. I don't think that's quite the case. Um, so here, like literally changing through scales, going into the tissue, falling down into the thylakoid membrane, where uh, where really the magic happens as as the photons that come from the sun hit photosystem two to excite electrons and drive an electron transport chain to produce ATP. Things that I studied when I was in college and I was focusing on astrobiology, which made me think about how microbiology and, and, and small scale uh, uh, mechanisms affected planetary scales. And in many ways, this is a, a very important part of what climate change is about uh, in, in, in how we came up to have the temperature that we have today through this beautiful uh, metabolism, but also in how much through our, our CO2 uh, reversal through combustion are changing the, the planetary scale. And that's, to some extent, the thesis that we kind of wanted to test to see is can we, through education of maybe the next generation on how, how they, under, they understand the, the deep relationships between our role and planet Earth. Um, and let me see. Okay, so uh, one last thing that, that we did was work with a company that we're still working very closely, a uh, Spanish renewable energy company, Iberdrola, on researching the role that um, AR, augmented reality, um, uh, can have in the management of the electrical power system. So I think this is, I'm just showing another dome where it, it, that spiral is a, is a timeline. So you can go back to 13.7 billion years ago um, or 4.5 if you want to see the with the planet. So Iberdrola is in the United States, it's called Avangrid. Um, and this is more like a platform to look at their operations in the United States and being able to think about loading, uh, for example, a wind turbine in, in this case, Oklahoma, that they don't have any operations and being able to load assets into that. So as we're also around thinking about uh, transmission and energy system uh, operators, um, 
how VR um, and eventually augmented reality uh, can be used in the process. This is uh, also crossing scale into um, first a regional, then a transmission. So we did a whole project around uh, a specific microgrid. These are transmission lines going to substation, then through a distribution line going to a specific microgrid uh, near Yale. Um, and um, they were very interested in thinking about how we can create simulators uh, for the next generation of uh, uh, electrical power system operators. Um, this, we go literally into the building level and one of the things in our palette allows is to think about adding different distributed energy resources like batteries to a building or an energy efficiency program. Um, this is within a specific microgrid that was developed in the, um, the town of Woodridge just uh, 10 minutes from Yale. Um, and uh, this, this was a, an interesting way of exploring this, this, this field. Um, we thought one of the interesting things that we came up with was um, the role of, uh, and I'll show now as soon as I, um, um, I go into uh, the, the process of a transmission system operator um, that uh, we loaded something called the scenario generator. So different things that happen as an operator is looking at, at the normally the single line diagram of their regional uh, network um, and produce, uh, so there's, in this case, there's a loss, a surge loss power is down, the operator doesn't really know what, what happens. Normally they see a lot of uh, um, messages of error, but they don't really see in context what's the probability of what happened. So what we said is, well, can we use augmented reality to drive information about the system to the operator in real time while they're in, in an operator in room, providing, using machine learning, what's the statistical pr uh, um, probability of what drove that surge loss? And so that uh, it, it, there's, I think that's, that was a, a good um, insight that we had around uh, being able to, in this case, there's another scenario and there's a problem with a wind turbine. And so we literally explore the possibility of loading um, information of a, of a wind turbine and a failure. So a sensor sending information. So these are really, you know, directly connected to a 3D asset and being able to send that information to perhaps a, an operator that goes to the field um, and uh, through augmented reality headsets are, are able to send information how to fix a problem if they're uh, 100 meters above um, on, a, on a wind turbine. So I, I'm, uh, this, this gives an overview of a bit of what, what the project's about. Um, I'm, it, we, we think that it's also something we can work on a little bit more around education on, on wind energy. Because uh, I don't want you to still feel motion sickness. I'm going to stop it there. Um, uh, this is this is more explaining a bit of this immersive power grid simulator. I guess the other insight that we had from doing this prototype was um, virtual reality is uh, great in its immersive setting, but um, operationally it's not very useful. You're you're totally inside this this world. But um, the the capacity of mixed reality as the broader field of both. Um, uh, produces that augmented reality is probably the best use for operational um, use cases, particularly in corporations and, and, and companies and um, their industrial processes. But VR is a great setting to test augmented reality applications. And so this was a, a big insight just from testing that, that, that it, it's just, you know, it's a lot easier to test something on a virtual world than going up to uh, the top of a wind turbine to test an augmented reality application. And augmented reality it can be straight out of your phone, like uh, something like Pokemon Go, if you have heard of it. Um, anyways, that's um, Energy Academy. And um, I want to talk a bit about the second project, Open Solar, which is obviously, you know, these projects change names. Um, and right now it's focused on project finance, but the beginning of this project really started in 2017. I was still here and Hurricane Irma and Maria uh, hit the whole Caribbean region, taking down uh, entirely the electrical grid of Puerto Rico and uh, British Virgin Islands, a whole bunch of other places. So what, what, what Puerto Rico and Maria produced is the exposure of the vulnerability of centralized power grids. Um, Puerto Rico is 100% dependent on imported um, uh, uh, fuels, but also their entire grid had one point that as soon as you took that point down through a climate impact, the whole thing went down. And uh, so what we thought first is um, 
how can we uh, uh, enable more transactive microgrids so that we increase resilience in the Puerto Rican grid? Um, and so part of the work that I had done in my PhD was the role that blockchain can have in transactive energy systems. And so this was a no brainer to start working on, on the role that uh, blockchain can have in microgrids for uh, island economies particularly. But working with a network of schools um, and the, the Puerto Rican government, oh, I was kind of lucky that the um, Puerto Rican government governor and the innovation officer are uh, alums from uh, MIT. So they came at, to MIT and said, hey, this, this really exposed uh, all vulnerability. We'd love to get you guys to produce a lot of ideas. Um, so uh, the key leverage point that we thought was not you know, fancy transactive microgrids for Puerto Rico, but the local community and the schools did not have any financial capacity to finance just more decentralized energy infrastructure. So finance was the key. Um, microgrids as well, but you can't have transactive microgrids if you don't have the devices in the first place. So that, that led us to think about, well, an application of using smart contracts um, of um, financing an asset through Internet of Things, uh, IoT, that is able to inform about what's happening on, on, uh, on a deployment. So this is one of our first pilots that, that we installed in, in a Puerto Rican school. And I guess this is a bit of what uh, uh, encompasses the project, is, is looking at the Internet of Things and, and blockchain for uh, smart solar financing. Uh, have IoT devices that are directly connected to smart contracts. Smart contracts are basically just computer code that uh, self-executes um, uh, actions and transactions in a, in a distributed ledger um, framework, a blockchain, for example. Um, if certain things are um, uh, pre-agreements are, are um, confirmed. And so normally the structure, the logic of a smart contract is if this, then that. So if energy is generated, then uh, it can execute automatic payments. It can execute a certificate for renewable energy uh, um, and carbon attestation, green, green attestation to, to a, a device, uh, but also ownership change. So if we think about what is, it, what is a key part about a transactive microgrid or community-owned microgrid by, for a, a place like Puerto Rico is um, if you have a 20-year power purchase agreement, which someone's just paying, as, which has been the, the primary um, business model driver of solar in the United States, the end user doesn't own the, the device. And so it, it is very hard for that device to be part of a local energy economy. So to do that, you, you kind of need the end user to own the system uh, sooner or later. So that's something that, that we, the registries based in, a, in a, a record keeping system like blockchain can help shift uh, ownership. So with that idea, we started setting up um, this logic of connecting end investors and end users through a finance platform, smart contracts to solve a lot of that, uh, developers that would install systems, uh, the hardware, the IoT infrastructure to inform uh, how the a project as it starts uh, evolves, gets deployed, interconnected, and starts producing energy. And the, the blockchain oracles are normally um, artificial intelligence um, um, computers, let's say, that, that are, are looking at a multiple variables and ex before executing a smart contract. I can talk a bit more about, about that. And then uh, tokens, let's say, or certificates uh, can, can run, be useful for renewable energy certification. I'm actually going to show you a live version of this. This is just to explain the, the, the fundamental logic at a, so this project to some extent has a, borrows a lot from financial technology, fintech, right? Um, so you have investors around the world uh, and they can invest in a specific project. They have their account on a bank account. Uh, as soon as they move money around, that produces a digital uh, uh, record of that and transforms fiat currency into stablecoin. And so that within, we've built the system in, in a, a, this is a bit fuzzy, it's hard to read, um, but a blockchain ecosystem called Stellar um, that is essentially designed for cross-border payments in a very low cost and very fast uh, procedure. And so when you have off takers that are paying for a, a renewable energy system, uh, they're on the other end and they're also paying back for, for a solar project. And the, the project act, acts like a large escrow account meaning that based on different variables, we'll, we'll uh, issue payments towards developers 
uh, will change ownership. Uh, so uh, really, as we were working on this, the, the role that we saw for a, a fintech platform like this was through project finance as opposed to other forms of finance. Um, and that led us to say, well, let's, let's build a platform. And let's, one, I guess one of the things that we, we try to focus is in user experience and user interfaces as a way of developing agile development, fast prototyping uh, for these ideas that, that start from a real world problem, but then spin off to um, an actual possible application. So just a couple of weeks ago, um, let me see if I can, uh, I probably I have to exit this or, let me see. There it is. I think that will work. Yeah. So actually, this is a live website. It's called openx.solar. Um, you need an access code to access it, but if you want to use it, let me know. Uh, it's it's uh, not fully live in the sense that it, it doesn't allow m m moving real money yet. Um, but it, it describes a bit of the logic of what we've been building. Uh, the invest function, the develop a project from scratch function, and then if you're a beneficiary or receiver from those fundings, um, and again, the logic is open and frictionless project finance for uh, decentralized infrastructure. And, and the reason why it's called openx.solar, uh, the, the URL, is because when we started building the, the nuts and bolts of a platform like this, um, we realized that project finance could be a key driver for climate finance in general. If you need to finance a, a project around uh, a, a forest conservation initiative, the mechanisms of linking bank accounts and linking smart contracts that execute certain things based on um, revising if, if some, some uh, events are met through, for example, sensors, uh, internet connected sensors, was the same. So we, we kind of separated and said, well, let's build OpenX, and then on top of that, let's build Open Solar. But that is just, just jargon for software structure, something that sits in the back end and so things that sits on top of that as well. Um, so let's see if we can, um, I can explain a bit of how, how one would use. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to log in um, uh, openlab at test.com. Uh, I think it might be case sensitive. I'm going to log into one account. So in this, um, in this case, um, would be a password. Password. See how that works. Great. So we're in. We're in. Um, uh, the the explore function shows the type of projects that we have loaded here. Um, so this is all information that is uh, coming in from a, uh, an API and application um, um, uh, interface. From a lot of the information is sitting on this blockchain ecosystem. So. Uh, this is the first project that we deployed in Puerto Rico. Here's, for example, the 10 megawatt, uh, one megawatt project in New Hampshire. Uh, these are dummy projects, but um, uh, they help us stress test the design of the platform. It looks very much like a crowdfunding platform, right? Because in many ways, it's crowd investing for projects. And some, uh, all of these are within the United States, and that produces some complexities around uh, having to deal with the Security Exchange Commission because we normally see investments to happen either in the track of equity, so equity crowdfunding, which is regulated in the United States, or debt through uh, bonds or conventional debt. And um, so this, for example, we, we could try to invest in one project, but then we, we, we have, a, the Yale University has a, a, a collaboration with the Rwandan government. And so what we thought was powerful is to think about how we can move money, large amount of capital, from rich countries like the United States and uh, areas like Europe into developing um, uh, world projects, um, such as Rwanda, Indonesia, because cross-border payments and cross-border investing is actually quite a frictionful process. And so this, we thought this was a, a valuable thing for a platform. Um, so when you load a project, this is a one megawatt uh, project in uh, New Hampshire, and it's, it, you can't really see this, but it's a stage four. So what we, we did is we structured all the stages between you have an idea of a project where you want to put your solar panels until you actually finance it, deploy it, interconnect it. There's a lot of things that we can codify it literally into smart contracts. Um, so in this case, there's an investment opportunity. It defines a lot of the terms, whether, again, this is quite fuzzy, but you can, you can if you have to, if you want to try it out, uh, the access code is just demo, demo, or lowercase. Um, whether there's a broker dealer, whether it's um, uh, an equity involved, what's the, the power purchase agreement tariff, all of the information as an investor uh, 
executive summaries, the opportunity. In this case, First Solar is described as the developer that won the tender. Um, so as an investor, you're seeing already the history of the project uh, and the, the context, again, project detail, like everything that you'd have to think of you want an investment project like that. Here are all the steps that a project goes through from like the ideation to signing uh, power purchase agreements and contracts. Um, and then this is a key part about the role that blockchain smart contracts can have. Again, it's a bit fuzzy, but um, here are the normal contracts that are normally involved in project finance. Uh, power purchase agreements, renewable energy certification agreements, your agreements with your developers, uh, your guarantors. So a couple of features that we thought were very important in terms of guarantor is blended finance. What that means is um, we wanted to find ways of, of lowering the cost of de-risking projects for investors. And a way to do that is to have an investor that is looked for uh, a return on investment, a monetary return on investment, but also uh, aid banks or people that are part, for example, even a family office can have an impact first um, approach. And so they can take first loss in a project. So in case of there's a breach in a power purchase agreement, you protect the conventional investors by having uh, funds that are, again, in an escrow account and they just, they take the first loss of the project. That just, just puts down the risk for investors. So that's a, what we call a guarantor agreement. Um, and, and, the, and the point is that smart contracts are the digital pieces that autom automate a lot of those legal contracts. Um, so here I would just press invest. So it says, you know, it will, it will look at uh, the funds that I have in my account. And let's see how, how uh, generous we want to be with Lancaster. Um, maybe $5,000 is pretty, pretty normal, normal amount. We, we think it's a good project. Uh, so this is literally running through a lot of the, the um, compliance um, that one would have for having even an unaccredited investor to invest in a project like that. I would inform of my tax country, so in the United States, um, whether I have any, any um, uh, issues uh, of um, like disclaimers. Um, revise my investment. Again, look at all the terms that I'm, that I'm signing, confirm, and um, it will take 30 seconds. Uh, hopefully this goes through. And so what this is doing is we, we don't, the, the account of the investor doesn't have real fiat currency, the US dollars. So we gave him a, a cryptocurrency that is just uh, for testing the platform, but that just gets transferred into stablecoin and that moves, so transaction completed, that's good. Um, that just moved uh, $5,000 uh, from the investor's account into the solar project account. And they're just frozen there um, until the final raise, which I don't know if it was a uh, megawatt, probably around two, two million um, reaches. And then uh, whoever the tender, uh, uh, whoever the developer is that won the tender uh, gets the first uh, installment. Um, any questions so far around, around the model? Um, here's a, the dashboard from the investor side. Uh, if I would be a, a receiver, let's say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a, my school uh, received an investment I would see what my offtake agreement is and all of this hard coded um, into the contract where I'm paying. I have funds where, I'm, where uh, my, my utility like payments are withdrawn from. Um, and I think here are uh, carbon and, and climate certificates that are used for, um, this is a big use for green bonds. If we think about what makes a green bond green, uh, requires some form of green attribute attestation to that. Um, so anyways, that, that, that's uh, open solar, and I wanted just to share a bit that uh, live demo, and we'll, we'll be progressing um, some of the, see, how do I go back to the keynote? Uh, here it is. Um, our next step with, with open solar is um, do a real world pilot. Uh, actually, I guess first is stress test the system. There's a lot of compliance um, around uh, moving payments and securities around things like that, but um, uh, we have uh, a pipeline of potential projects to pilot on using real investors and real projects. Um, the third project um, really comes a bit of from some of the, the thinking that I've had while I was here in the college. And uh, uh, when I think of uh, 1.5 degrees, thanks to all the, the, the talks uh, given by Malte, uh, I always think as the, the key issue of, of a carbon budget and the limited carbon budget, and this is a huge accounting problem, right? Uh, when I look at technologies like um, blockchain, 
it's really a boring accounting technology. There's, there's not much more to it, but it allows a lot of transparency and, and accountability to that. So I said, well, you know, um, a 1.5 tem temperature target has a, a, a very strict uh, budget going towards 2050, um, and it could have a single accounting ledger, accounting system. Um, and so the, the question of this project is whether, how, how do some of these digital technologies fit into this equation? Um, and when we think about, okay, what I try to simplify uh, processes, this is beautiful uh, um, graphs that Malte makes and I, I end up putting designs on top of it. But um, really, uh, a, a budget is a fixed, not really, you know, it, it changes every year, but um, really sets a, a, a fixed number and the real emissions that have to be uh, measured in respect to that number. And then uh, naturally we have our business as usuals, which are very subjective, uh, also fixed numbers uh, between countries and, um, and the climate action or reduction um, actions that are done in respect to that. So I've taken this very heuristical approach to try to simplify it into one number and a variable number, one number and a variable number, um, but also strictly dividing the planetary system, which is a single jurisdiction, whereas all the world political boundaries that we've invented around countries, and, uh, cities, uh, companies. And so um, the first thing we did, and this is a work, total work in progress, and we're thinking about this, this is why I think it's almost doing a bit of a brainstorm session here, the college would be great. Um, Blockchain is not a standalone technology, so it can have one specific role around accounting uh, systems and smart contracts. Um, but also Internet of Things produces a, a huge uh, simplification for Earth system monitoring. <coughs> Oracles uh, homogenize a lot of multiple data um, and use machine learning and AI to determine uh, exactly what's going on from a, um, um, let's say a, a third party intermediary. Uh, using an algorithm before executing a smart contract. Uh, big data, blockchain uh, are our agreements. And so um, we, we, we see that this has, you know, anything that we do around this has to be fundamentally open source, right? Um, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to think about a, a global accounting system that is proprietary. Um, so we've, we've actually been working with UNICEF Ventures, which is their innovation arm around the role of digital public goods. And it allows us to, almost evangelize the role of open source in some of these big picture uh, technologies. And so this project kind of is, is an example of that. Um, we did two things so far. There's, we started this like the end of last year. Um, one is to do a, a large uh, design sprints between different experts to think about how these technologies can have a role in the process of monitoring, reporting, and validating any climate event. Um, either it be a, a, an emission generation event or an emission reduction event. Um, and so this is, we don't have to go into detail, but it's really looking at parsing um, everything from something that happens in the IoT devices and every, how a blockchain record can keep track of that in the process. Um, and really think about the role that these uh, technologies, Internet of Things, is sensors that collect data, uh, reporting, machine learning and validating, uh, helping as a third party validator and, and process of issuance of certificates. Um, which um, led us to think about uh, one of our uh, partners at Yale is called uh, Data Driven uh, Data Driven Yale, but now it's called Data Driven Labs, and their focus is on non-state actors, so not not just nations, uh, but uh, cities, uh, companies, investors, which are uh, becoming the climate champions in in, uh, in the post Paris world. And so here's a, a framework uh, that we just submitted a, a grant to the National Science Foundation to start researching this more because non-state actors are, have a, a huge a scope of heterogeneous ways of doing things, setting up their climate pledges in ways that are very hard to aggregate to see if what they're doing actually sticks up to a science-based target. And so here's just a framework of proposing how blockchain can self, um, be applied to that. And as opposed to open solar, for example, where we see this is uh, the NASCA portal by uh, UNFCCC, which is the hub for all non-state actors that pledge their climate reduction, or as a corporation or a city, or the city of Melbourne, um, to either the carbon disclosure project or climate registries. Uh, uh, NASCA brings a lot of this information, so you can go to climateaction.unfccc.int. Um, 
So we think about what would be a technology that we could develop that could sit behind NASCA because these are static climate pledges. Uh, Melbourne, you, Melbourne uh, City says, we're gonna reduce our, uh, our emissions by this amount by this year. Well, there's no really accountability in a central record keeping system. So we thought that there was a role in, in, in working with um, UN bodies or multilateral stakeholders to think about uh, any technology that we can build. And we don't know exactly what to build. So this is why it's a, an exciting part. And my approach, uh, also hard to navigate, is to make a meta diagram to try to, what I'm putting here is earth system, earth system monitoring, global inventories, uh, um, climate models, integrative assessment models, and uh, IPCC reports. So the, the earth system layer, uh, the world system registries, nations, sub-nations, um, non-state actors. Uh, this is the, the standardization of monitoring, reporting, and verification of any, any climate action. And a concept uh, around networked carbon markets. So. Paris, as opposed to Kyoto, has a very bottom-up approach. Uh, Kyoto had a central warehouse and uh, uh, a system where all countries had to uh, deal with any form of emission um, uh, transfer or trading. Uh, Paris, being bottom-up, produces a lot of heterogeneity in either methodologies, but also in the possibility of, of, of climate markets. So Article 6, for example, talks about the international transfer of mitigation outcomes. And so um, based on this uh, logic that as we explore the role these emerging digital technologies can have in global climate accounting, um, the World Bank uh, as an organization has been very interested in the role that Article 6 of the Paris Agreement can have into how do we, how do we deal with fungibility, meaning like actual transacting um, uh, climate assets in a fundamental bottom-up framework. Uh, like uh, like what Paris um, Article 6 uh, presents, which is not yet defined. It's still being negotiated and signed. And so they're very interested in, in obviously, the role that distributed ledgers have. And so I've been doing some reviews of, of reports and seeing what we can do with them. Um, but in, uh, in, in basic essence, uh, this is this just shows a market and another market. I think I have a PDF of this if you want to go deeper into it. Um, if you have some form of bilateral agreement that allows, uh, let's say, Melbourne's uh, reduction to fit within Australia's NDCs and any excess of that can be transferred to another country, um, there needs to be a framework for that and the way that bilateral agreement would have with the other country. Um, if it complies with specific um, procedures, a smart contract can transfer the, the logic of that trade to a, a more fungible transaction, let's say, uh, that might allow another country that is no, not part of that bilateral agreement. I don't know if that makes sense, but that, that is what explains the logic of climate markets that are not, um, uh, it, it's not like you have one central warehouse that allows for interoperability. You just have forms of um, contractual um, protocols that countries agree that allow any form of you know, Asia Pacific region being able to also trade with other parts of the world. Um, early, very early stages, but very exciting. And how that can fit with climate finance as well. And so when I think about some of these pieces, I, I think about portals and platforms um, and um, can't see if they're from the top, but the thought of having a central, um, which is a funny word, but like a, a, a portal that allows you to uh, visualize some of these things. Um, our approach to dealing with this global uh, ambitious idea is to do a series of design sprints where we get a whole bunch of uh, experts um, like college PhD students and uh, um, uh, faculty at the university to think about what are key pain points around this uh, global carbon and climate accounting uh, ecosystem and come up with product sprints. And, and, um, and one of the things we've been testing is instead of doing a, a hackathons, we do like collabathons, which is how we describe this process, where uh, teams don't compete against each other. They build a part of a bigger puzzle. Uh, you can still have a, a leaderboard and you still have a, the best hack, um, but, but they're still building pieces of a bigger umbrella and a bigger puzzle. Um, and then the other thing is we, the summer, which is probably the summer in the United States, um, uh, June to August, how are we doing on time? Um, is to put together a team 
of students, developers, blockchain engineers, and we'll be doing prototypes around this project. So by, I'd say, September, we'll have a, a prototype about, about what we came up with uh, in terms of this. And so it'd be great to uh, share some of the outcomes and then iterate naturally. Um, that's it. The, these are the three things that I wanted to, to share. Um, I'd love to open for questions. Uh, thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Martin. Do we have any questions? Up back. Um, Andrew Rothberg, I work for Sustainability Victoria, so a Victorian government agency. Um, you spoke about like the fusion between um, academia, I can't recall, entrepreneurship and entrepreneur, yeah, entrepreneurs. What do you see as the role for government? I know that the Victorian mm. government have funded hackathons recently or in the mm. last 12 or so months, but is there a more sort of, yeah, what, what do you see as the role in that fusion? Absolutely. Well, let's think about um, let's think about the Puerto Rico project that I talked about, right? So literally, we interact with government. There's a real world problem, and government understands the problem, or sometimes doesn't fully understand the problem, and reaches out to a university to say, "Hey, help us think through this." Um, so there's a way of you know, academia is great at at really parsing a problem, um, whereas un normal entrepreneurs are like. What's the opportunity that something we can build to make money? Now, that's the legacy way of thinking in entrepreneurship. Whereas the fusion between an academia and entrepreneurship can say, and interacting with government says, government can, can produce an environment for research to come up with um, what I call leverage, what we understand as leverage points, as in like that complex problem. Um, and then through design thinking, come up with ideas that allows entrepreneurs to take them forward to see if that can produce a solution for that. But it, but it takes the bigger picture that academia can have and the practical so problem solution uh, connection that government also needs. Sorry, yep. Um, you probably don't want a bureaucrat in the room collaborating, but do you see a role for like the pe like government um, Officers are, you know, doing the carbon accounting and whatnot. Is there a role for actual collaboration? Yeah. Or is it a sort of government sets up the environment, you know, the the uh, yeah the, the environment for it to happen, and then just lets it go? Or is there are there examples where there's a role for yeah. governments to um, collaborate on solutions? Yeah, and and I would say um, I haven't had any issue around like government bureaucracy kind of like tempering the process. But at some points, working with corporations, um, this is kind of similar. It's like, hey, we want we have this problem, and we want you guys to think about you know solutions around this. And there's moments where it you just have to kick them out of the room for a little bit um, uh, and say, you know, when's our next checkpoint in a in a month? Let's meet up again in a month. But 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 sometimes you need a lot of space for the innovation process to happen without. And this happens even in internal uh, like projects. You have someone in a, in a design team that is always thinking in the nitty gritty details and the bureaucracy. And sometimes you need that person, but sometimes it can uh, it can prevent from you to have having out of the box thinking. And so it's it's always a a, a process around that. I, I think one of the things that I think it's very important for government to have is that you kind of constantly have them as an advisors. It's like, hey, we're thinking about this. What do you think about it? You need to have that constant gauge. If you're working with a company, it's like, we have this idea. Does this actually work for you guys or no? And so it kind of anchors a, a, an, an ideation process to, to practical use. And if it's not adopted, then the team kind of fails in that sense. Okay, great. Uh, we've kind of run out of time. Uh, are you able to hang around? Yeah, yeah. Moment? So I'm, if anyone's I'm, got any questions and like to, to tackle Martin, please feel please. free to hang around. Before I let you go, we have to... Is there, a, is there another question that maybe can be useful for everyone else? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Martin. Chris Swain from Gardner. Um, is this slide deck available? Um, would you be able to share it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, the video is... 500 megabytes <laughs> um but uh I'll, yeah i can uh, send it to the college and um and then really openlab.yale.edu whenever i have time i update it so a lot of the pro basically a lot of the logics that are here are there and and the, the th this presentation has been recorded you got to watch it. oh really <laughs> I, I believe so isn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> great so uh we, we need to to thank the, our supporters for this event the victorian clean technology fund 
Uh, so thank you very much for your, your support. It's uh, greatly appreciated. Um, Malti, do we have any upcoming talks you wanted to mention? <laughs> Yes, I, I think I had to put a slide, but uh, I forgot to put that slide. But maybe you can, you can jump in. Um, let me just bring it up. I, I also want to thank the college again for letting me uh, be here and, and, and share this. It's, um... So thank you, Martin. That was fantastic. It's really nice to see where all your PhD um, ideas and energy goes in, in the next stage. Uh, so that was a really nice roadshow. Yes, we do have more seminars. Um, tomorrow evening, it is um, the second of Professor Rosgano's lectures, the six-part lecture series here. I'm not sure whether it's booked out. Probably it is. Um, but we have uh, a couple of more of them uh, coming. So um, also the next week, Wednesday evening, again here on the electricity sector. Um, tomorrow it will be on the complex international and domestic economics of climate change. So if you want to attend some of these lectures, uh, go to our website and register. Um, and then we have um, on the... 26, also the um, a scholar from Canada coming out on the big pipeline debates. Um, it's a quite interesting. Canada is all about the pipeline, um, whereas we are all about um, Adani here in our domestic discussions. Um, and yeah, have a look on our website. There are in fact, five or six more seminars coming up. Um, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Uh, Roger for hosting and big thanks again to Martin for a fantastic seminar.